Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. How's life this week? <laughs> life is a delight. Uh, beautiful, sunny uh, Hawaii, my favorite place on earth, actually. Although, uh, both it, it, Oahu and the Big Island have different charms. But this week, Oahu, got to take care of business. Next week, the Big Island. Hawaii, How about you, man? How's, Hawaii is yeah. also my favorite place um, on Earth. It, it, ever since, Great uh, minds. Ever since uh, Herbert Holtz's uh, approach to Hawaii, actually, that's the first time I ever went. Um, uh, you know, I, I went out to do the sixteen thousand dollar lightning helix, um, and uh, we we never looked back. That became like the main. The, I mean, eventually, you know, that became a place where we we like to go every couple of years anyway. Uh, for vacation. Yeah, this is the fifth one. Oh, that you and your family. Oh, oh yeah. That's I mean, oh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I went for a pro tour the first time, um, you know, but uh, then we just adopted the state as our, our thing that we like to do. Uh, but, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I could see myself living here if it weren't for the commute. I mean, what if, It's just what, so far away. I mean, what if Direwolf sent up an office over there? Still too far away. I, I travel too much. I have to go too many places. Denver is a direct flight away from New York, direct flight away from San Diego, from Seattle, from everywhere, you know? Hey, man. Uh, Honolulu's got multiple direct flights to New York. Believe me, I know. Yeah, to New York. Every, I mean, you can get direct flight to New York from the moon. Well, um, you know, that's, that's the reason why I live in New York, because, you know, my frequent trips to the moon, uh, to visit the man in the moon. But, you know, whatevs. Uh, I'm glad you're having a good week. Um, I love Hawaii. Uh, I'm having an all right week, too. Uh, but I was, I was thinking some awesome stuff about Magic the Gathering, actually, we could talk about. Old, oh, I love it. Old and new awesome things. So um, I thought we'd talk about a, a, a couple of things that, that are that are uh, foundational texts for us, and then a couple of things that are new and modern new uh, and Kaladesh new at the same time. So um, love it. what do you want to hit first, old or new? You tell me, man. I'm down for whatever. All right, so let's start with a little nostalgia. As long as we can end on something blue. Yeah. Because I'm going to need, like, a control deck for this weekend. But uh, I'm thinking, like, maybe right now we'll start with something old, something new, and something blue will come when I'm swimming in the ocean later tonight. So we will we will end on something blue for sure. Okay, so uh, I, I don't know about you, but this, this, is, a, this is actually really important to me. Um, when I was, like, in the mid-'90s, uh, before the internet was big, uh, we had like a computer lab and I would go down and I was just desperate to learn anything more about magic. I, I, I think this is probably a, a foreign idea to most of our listeners who are, who are just covered in, in great content on a daily basis, right? There's so many great websites today that have so many great content creators, professional content creators, who are talking about the metagame and, and all kinds of stuff and tournament results and crazy decks and brews and archetype decks. You know, you could get whatever kind of content you want today, and a lot of it's really good. But back in the day, that wasn't the case. And I I stumbled on this thing, and it just honestly changed my life. So I stumbled, among other things, on this thing called Schools of Magic written by an NYU student named Robert Hahn. And Schools of Magic, it changed my life on a couple of different vectors. Number one, it was this first, I think, the, the first serious thing that the internet ever had that was like, this is how magic works. If you read this kind of stuff and consume this kind of material, you stand a chance of becoming better at magic or at least understanding magic better. And then the thing that was crazy was, oh, I like this thing. It was the best thing I'd ever read, at least on the internet about magic, schools of magic. And then Rob Hahn goes and wins a PTQ, like a week after I read this thing that he had just written. So I'm like, oh, shoot, man. Apparently, if you become a great Magic the Gathering strategy writer, that can dovetail into winning tournaments. And Rob Hunt <laughs> like, win like a 5K, he won like a PTQ. And this is, this, I, I think the listeners who, maybe at least the ones who haven't been following me for 20 years, right, probably don't know this. I end so Rob Hahn actually went on to from being a not very successful professional Magic the Gathering player to running the duelist and running the duelist sideboard for a while. Then he went and basically not bought but like partnered with with uh, Frank Kusamoto at the dojo. And then I basically left my whole like 
college, Ivy League, <laughs> law school life, ran off to clown school in New York City to go work for Rob Hahn at the dojo in, like, 1999, and I never looked back. And so, like, basically, it started in, like, 96, read this guy's magic article, decided that I was going to become a professional magic player because there was a, a connection between being able to be a good Magic the Gathering strategist, which I wasn't at the time, right? I, be- I tried to become one, at least over time, because I wanted to be, you know, a good tournament player. Fought, then actually just rewrote my life uh, following Rob around. But the thing is, about Schools of Magic in particular, you know, most people are probably not going to take my path, it actually gave us a lot of the framework and the language that we have. So just as an example... The most famous of the schools is probably the Weissman School, right? The, the control school. And yeah, I mean, the, 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 the idea, you know, being put, put forward of card advantage and uh, minimizing, you know, playing with the fewest victory conditions necessary. And even the victory conditions he chose were selected for their ability to also defend. And then using so, you know, so much more emphasis on generating mana and uh, using restricted cards, using as many powerful cards as possible. But in general, it was the first, like, true control deck. Like, yeah. so pure. Like, it just created this concept of of playing defense, right? So, when, when you... So, something I do want to jump in, though, before sure. before we get too much, just to kind of... To, to kind of tie it together, just to be clear, when we're talking about the schools of magic, this is language that people were using to describe this incredibly rich and uh, compelling world. This is before there was any magic theory. You know, like this, it wasn't always the case that people understood card advantage. The card oh, advantage no. was even like a, a language, right? If people didn't have words for things like color hoser or a side, you know, like a <laughs> transformational sideboard or, you know, no, like being, uh, you know, like running somebody out of cards as a strategy or having a mana curve, like all yeah, these there things. There was no concept somebody, of a mana curve yet when schools of magic. Somebody invented these concepts in different points, and the schools of magic is one of the oldest and most important areas of magic theory. This is this was actually the beginning of unifying some of the early titans of magic theory. Some of the early people that came up with strategies and had thoughts and ideas before there were even like it wasn't even like there were people didn't even have like styles. Like you know how now people just take it as a given, oh yeah, there's a red aggro deck in some formats and there's you know a blue control deck or maybe like a black white mid range or jund or whatever. It wasn't like that. And the schools of magic that were that as originally presented were these are these are ideas that were very, very like revolutionary and at times conflicting with each other because they weren't attempting to explain everything. They were each just an approach. It was like different styles of music. And so some of the ideas may sound uh, slightly, you know, odd or different by nowadays standards, but this was early in the genre of music before they had even figured out very much about it. It's not even that because I think part of it is that over the ensuing 20 years, right, the ideas that were quote-unquote right just became part of the magic vernacular. Exactly. Some of the other... And this was... This was a lot of other names. Yeah, like, so, I mean, Weissman is the most most enduring of the names of the schools, but there were more than one, and there were really interesting angles on these things, I think, that are are worth uh, revisiting and seeing how we can contextualize that today. But, you know, spoilers on this one... One of the one of the kind of stretch rewards we have on our Patreon is folks who are at a certain tier can say, like, "Oh, they can they can help uh, develop the topic for an episode." And Sean O'Brien, which is one of our our most generous uh, Patreon supporters, actually had this idea for an episode. And Sean, which is I, I had no idea it was the same guy, uh, even though even though I had read Schools of Magic when it first came out. He is one of the original guys, the O'Brien School, and you know, twenty years later, he's. He like you know is a is a consumer of top level podcasts and he's like I'm glad he picked a good topic. This is an interesting topic, right? So you know you're talking about threats, you know a small number of threats that can play defense. Sarah Angel was how Brian Weissman wanted to win the game back in 1995, 1996. Isn't it cool 
that there's just like Sarah Angel's way, way, way better like great granddaughter now. Like Archangel Avison is just that is like the modern day Sarah Angel and more. Hmm. Hmm. That's what you've got, like Archangel Avison. Like, imagine Sarah Angel with just Sarah Angel with Flash. Like how how Weissman that is. I mean, she gets played in creature decks, but well, that's see, that's the part that's different to me. Even though she literally is a four four flyer with like an angel that's a four four flyer with vigilance. To me, the the things that she encourages you to do to play with, it kind of necess you know necessarily oh, sure. takes you in a different path. See, when I think of, like, the creature that is most like the Sarah Angel of Weissman era, I think of things like, um, I think of Restoration Angel to some degree, but even that isn't as extreme. I think that it's Snapcaster Mage, but really Celestial Colonnade is the most pure, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Like, so one of the things that's awesome about the Weissman deck, at least when it came out, was... You had cards like Terror and Swords to Plowshares that a lot of people, you know, were opening their alpha packs or their unlimited packs. Like, oh, these cards are make a lot of sense to play because they're such efficient creature removal, right? These are creature removal cards that, you know, be heavily played if, if we had them um, in, in standard today, right? Which we obviously Absolutely. Know. So... Lightning Bolt, Swords to Plowshares, Terror, all of them would be. So Weissman's big thing was just don't play a lot of creatures. And then people are going to have a bunch of these cards like... Terror and, and lightning, even though even lightning bolt only does three, can't hit a can't hit a four four. They're going to be stuck in their hand, and they're not going to be able to to do anything until I've you know incapacitated them. Then I'm going to play my Sarah Angel. But we we retain. I think if you look at uh, like the black white control deck that was uh, one of the main decks, you know, very recently up until the winner of the, the most rotation. Recent, yeah, the most recent Pro Tour. That deck has a lot of thematic similarities, right? So. This, the the Weissman deck, you know, even if it was a counterspell blue-white deck, the idea of using cards like Disrupting Scepter or, you know, today's analogs, things like uh, Transgress the Mind or Duress, to take away somebody's answer and then be able to beat them with your, you, you know, Sarah Angel or your Planeswalker maybe today. Uh, well, you know, Planeswalkers are offense-defense cards too. I think that that theme still still resides in, in, in Magic today. And even though it's not a counterspell deck... I think it has a lot of the, that give and go. See, I, I I think that the I do think the Weissman school is alive and well, but I, I actually think that the white black decks, while they're related in the sense that they uh, you know leverage both card uh, card economy uh, and then also making some of their you know blanking some of their opponent's cards. Uh, I, I actually think that that they are. One of, I think that one of the things that has happened is that there's been a lot more diversification and exploration of different parts of Magic's game engine as they've shifted, as Wizards has shifted where they put the power and how much they put the power in creatures. I actually think that the the better, like the the the, the Weissman school more 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 cleanly, I guess, lives on today in uh, the the control decks that you'll see, like uh, for instance. At the uh, you know the Esper decks that we saw at the Pro Tour two Pro Tours ago, that were sweepers, spot removal, some counter spells, some card draw, win with planeswalkers or creatures with hexproof. To me, that is that's the Weissman school still at large, you know. Yeah. Because I think that one of the es- one of the elements that's important, it's an important distinction in the Weissman school, is the counter spell control of the game the uh instead of using duress to take your only answer and then dropping a threat and killing you before you draw another one it's about setting up a position where you and I, you do have disrupting scepter to wear down their hand but the uh it, it's much more about having control over the game and then switching to ending it and not using any resources to try to win the game until it was already won it was just don't lose, don't lose, don't lose, and once you can no longer not like as long once you get to the spot where you can no longer lose, then you can get to the business of winning. Yeah. I think- Whereas I, I think that like uh, actually the 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 O'Brien school, the one where because uh, I'm actually looking at that the one of the the early articles as we speak, and one of the the big things that I see here is actually something that I think lives on 
to this day, even though there is no longer the same amount of land destruction, yep. which is the, the discard element that you're, that you're speaking of, the disrupt them a little bit and then win. Because this one uh, is actually just uh, disrupting the other person for a little bit. Well, a single threat, whether it's a Jew Zamjin, a Juggernaut, a, uh, or a Black Vice, kills them. You know, and uses like um, sinkholes, ice quakes, and strip mines to disrupt their mana, as yeah, well as Nether Void. You know, yes, well, Nether Void is the real one. Nether Void is the lock. That's the thing that. And so the idea is, you don't. You don't have to establish control. This one, this is a deck that, I mean, it has blue for, like, Ancestral Recall and Time Twister because that just sort of comes with the territory. But, like, the you don't need to have counterspells to, to uh, because you're not actually trying to take a complete control over the game. What you're trying to do is disrupt them long enough for the Juzam to hit them four times and end it. Yeah, and so, I think that we see that today with things like duress or trans. Well, not duress isn't legal anymore; it just rotated out. But if you have like transgressed the mind or duress before it rotated, so that like a Kalidus can live, sometimes you don't need Kalidus to live very long for Kalidus to take over the game. So, I was thinking like, um, so you know, the O'Brien school, you know, Sean's own own school, which is you know, sinkholes and ice quakes and strip mines are. They're baller, right? Like, you, you mess somebody up, and people don't really realize how much card advantage you gain by destroying people's lands, right? Like, you destroy enough of their lands, they can't cast any of their spells. It doesn't matter they have seven cards in hand, right? That That's kind of a different way to, to look at you know, maybe virtual card advantage. But I was kind of... Card thinking, economy. Yeah, like... That's the key. What do you think about, like, eight rack or something, right? Like, instead of destroying their land, just like, oh, like overloading them on like hand destruction like i'm just obviously i'm talking about a modern deck in, in this case right um where oh yeah and it's still black. i think you're actually right it's and actually it's like, like even more true yeah because i think, that, I think the, you're right is the the inheritor to this deck i think even though instead of destroying lands you're destroying hand you're basically like you just throw so many resources at like what the fundamental things that we have to play with from a resource perspective Lands in play. Every single deck that's ever existed in Magic has played at least two lands, right? Lands in no, play. No, 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 no. No? No. Nope. Nope? No. Nope. Oh, you're right. There's that one deck that, uh... You're right. So, I... One, like, one deck uh, has had no lands. <laughs> right, like, oops, no... Yeah, oops, yeah, oops all no spells. Lands. Yeah, yeah, oops, all spells has... And then, I guess Dredge kind of can, can not count. Right? But almost No, they every, have four. They have four. Sometimes five. But yeah, oops, oops, all spells, you're right. It, that one truly has zero. Has zero lands. Okay, fine. But almost every deck, right, is playing... Uh, it's the exception that proves the rule. Is 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 built on on lands first, and then the lands or the mana base, even if it's not specifically lands, being able to enable the cards that are in their hand that they drew off the top of their deck, you know, changing it to other resources, whether it's creatures, other ways to win, ways to interact with the opponent, etc. But you just throw, like, so many things at a certain type of resource that everybody plays with, and then they're, like, they're not completely in the lockdown. Like, the Weissman deck, you're like, destroy your hand with Disrupting Scepter, and even if you peel something good, I'm going to mana drain it, right? You don't have to do that because these guys are like, boom, here's like a significant threat, like a Juzum Jin in the case of the original O'Brien deck. Or, um, you know, in eight rack, you can just destroy their, their hand and then they're just getting destroyed by racks, right? You know, or whatever, yep. man, you know, creature lands or whatever you're going to, you're going to slam them with. But I think that's, well, that's the thing. It's, I, think, I think that's actually, it is, it is the pure, it is the most pure form of this same concept because uh, at the time, the best land destruction available, there's Sinkhole, Ice Quake, Strip Mine, Nether Void. That's, that's some really powerful stuff, right? But, I mean, even 8-Rack has powerful... I mean, Smallpox doesn't mess around. Oh, yes. Yeah. Smallpox would have been played in the O'Brien deck if he could have played it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, instead, now, while there is less... The, the disruption is a, li it's a little harder to come by as much disruption... It's easier to come by better threats because Juzam Jin and the Juggernaut cost a lot more mana. Oh, yeah. Whereas nowadays you get to play with eight racks that all cost one. Think about how how mana efficient multiple racks are for converting um, converting mana to damage, right? They're like, it's like lightning bolt every turn while disrupting the opponent's hand. It's actually phenomenal mana to, to, to output as long as your deck is going, right? I think that... And especially there's so many decks in Modern that actually just empty their hand themselves. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, it, and it, it's interesting seeing the amount that like because those cards can be so like so weak when they're not working. But that's the way it is with so many disruptive strategies. You know, like a counter spell is worthless if you're dead on board. <laughs> yeah. right? Like, and the sinkholes, ice quakes, and strip mines, they're like uh, sinkhole and ice quake. I mean, strip mine produces mana, so it's a little bit different of an example, but it's unbelievably broken. Sinkhole and ice quake are, are powerful magic cards, but they are good insofar as they stop the other person from playing their cards. Because this is a deck that has. 10 land destruction cards outright and three nether voids and a zenith poltergeist. This is uh, using a roughly a quarter of the deck to try to to try to beat half of the opponent's other of the opponent's deck. Because uh, if as long as your opponent can't actually cast spells, then you've effectively made all their cards worthless. You know what's awesome about these two schools that we started on, uh, on with this is that if you think about pillars of how magic is, has come from a language standpoint from the days of schools of magic to today, you're talking about the advent of control in Weissman, which is like before Weissman, there, was, there wasn't this concept of like, let's do something other than cast creatures and slam them against each other to try to deplete somebody's life. But the O'Brien school is like, it's like a surgeon, even though these cards are blunt instruments, like... Sinkhole and Juzum Jin, you look at these kind of cards and they obviously mean business, right? But he's aiming at a thing. Like, let's take a bunch of our 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 cards and focus. And if we focus and we push, push, push at a certain point in the opponent's deck, it's gonna break. I think that's a really interesting insight, right? Whether it's cards in hand, whether it's lands, well, you know, whether it's something else. So there's formats where just killing all the creatures is a thing that um that that can uh, that can promote that kind of um, uh, a, you know break the opponent's strategy just by sheer redundancy or what Eric Taylor would have called Morsies, right? Like I have more of this thing that stops your resources than you have resources. Um, I think there's like just one other school maybe I want to touch on. Uh, Why? Well, I, I, if I could, okay. I wanted to mention one note, though, about the Weissman school that I thought is it, – it's so often overlooked these days because Weissman was such a prolific writer and theorist in mind about it. There were two other uh, – there were two other peers of Weissman at the time, at least, and uh, others as well because they were all collaborating with people. But um, both Matt Place and Mike Long also – did an incredible amount for helping advance this control strategy. Now, Weissman's was debatably the most pure, but like, uh, I think, and like Matt Place and the other people in his area, they, their big difference between the Weissman school and, and their style was the use of, of, uh, things like Tetravis or Triskelion and then the Abyss. And oh, it was sort of, of their a, angel moat. Yeah. Well, and well, or they would use, Right, like if it was Tetravis, Tetravis was actually favored. But so Triskelion was was one that that Matt Place often would prefer with the Abyss. Eric Taylor was actually a person who tried to hybridize the two and and helped lead a Tetravis revolution, which combined Moat and the Abyss, because he figured that Moat could stop the people with Triskelion and the Abyss could stop people with Sarah Angel, and Tetravis would live through it all. Oh, these Meanwhile, guys were all such geniuses. They were, like, meditating oh, against each other 20 years before there was any magic strategy. <laughs> yes. And then Mike Long, Mike Long's approach, uh, Mike Long was his keeper strategy style. It was very similar principles, but a little bit more blunt instruments at time, a little bit more fancy tech. The big twist on Mike Long's approach was uh, the, the, the real one. He gets credit for stuff like elemental augury that it wasn't actually the most important part of the strategy. The big twist that Mike Long uh, helped lead was the Merchant Scroll Revolution. Mike Long was one of the first people who really identified when Homelands came out that Merchant Scroll changed, was going to change everything. Why play one you know, demonic little, tutor when you could play more than one? Yeah, and uh, his his warping like Mike Long was a big fan of the look. So the best cards are so much better than the other cards. Let's make it all about that. He was like he was in for main deck red elemental blast. He's in for force of will as soon as they printed it. He was in for 
uh, miss like things that change the target. So we could try to steal your like misdirection in a control deck. Sure, I want to steal your ancestral recall, and then Merchant Scroll just to go get ancestral recall because one of the things he realized was how much. The best cards are the only – they are the thing that matter the most, and everything else should be a tool to stopping your opponent from playing their best cards or enabling you to find and play your best cards. Oh, I remember, um, Vinny, so, 10 years after this happened, right, more than 10 years after after the, a lot of these conversations, when, when you were coming up as a, a great Magic strategy writer, you would write about vintage – um, even to a wider audience and say, like, what are the most important cards? Like Ancestor Recall, Black Lotus, you know, what are the what are the chances that somebody has to win when they resolve this card, right? Just this one card. Like that, those are things that are, are, you know, it's been 10 years since I think you wrote some of these articles. They're, they're still very meaningful to me. Uh, and obviously, obviously the idea of key cards is probably one that is native to most of our listeners at this point, right? They understand that not all cards are, are created equal and you know, I think if Mike's innovations are around creating redundancy around those best cards, that you know, obviously worth uh, a great deal of acknowledgement as well. But yes, all of these these uh, you said there's another one of these schools because there's like oh, there were I don't know, I don't remember how many were there were there were like uh, in the original batch were there like I don't know half a dozen or something more than half a dozen but like seven some, or eight I don't remember yeah okay. some of them are like really close like the Masonette school is basically the Weissman school of Jester's Camp right so like it. It's you know Adam Masonette was a multi-time uh, Pro Tour competitor from the southeast, and so but the idea was like when Jester's Cap was printed, if you resolved the Jester's Cap, you might actually put Weissman in a pretty bad situation, right? You just cap his Sarah Angels and his he might he might not have a way to win anymore, and he's going to deck now because his deck is three cards too small, right? Like well, that, well you 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 just take his Brain Geyser and his two yeah. uh, Sarah Angels and he's cold yeah so like the idea that you could do that to someone that was actually an innovation at the time that it came out and it was specifically good against weissman right because these other decks had you know four juggernauts and four jews of Jins and hypnotic specter they had more more ways to win than just a few but like if you took the weissman principles and then you traded out these sarah angels that were attacking and defending and then you you went jester's cap you had the implications, right? There are decks like this still where we're like, let's just play the purest control strategy we can, and we are just going to try to drag this game out, right? Like, think of, like, any Brian Schneider kind of Gaia's Blessing decks that 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 um, those guys, or, like, you know, John Finkel is, it, at times in his career, the guiltiest of, can I drag this out with, with Gaia's Blessing? Now, obviously, those aren't very recent now, but... You know what I mean, right? There, 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 there are yep. these decks that are like, let's just drag out our resources. It's my deck against your deck for the next forty-five minutes. You know, um, but the one that I wanted to talk about, which I think is, I think next to Weissman is the most enduring, is the Kim School. And the Kim School is just kind of like, what are all the best cards we can play? <laughs> you know, uh, exclusive of a specific strategy or synergy, but like we can just play like the, you know, for want of a better term lightning bolts and you know whatever else the best are it, the 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 archetype version of the kim school and in, in type two they called it back then was just like green white get or like you know urnum jin was the best creature armageddon was the best disruptive card right sword supply shares was the best removal card you know they had land tax and fell you know they had the best mana because they had both uh you know they had birds of paradise or land or elf type stuff but they also had land tax they got to use the dual lands, and at the time there were there were no enemy dual lands. There was just the friendly ones, so it's a friendly color combination. And they used uh, the colorless lands that were just overpowered and did things like strip miner, Mishra's factory. They it was it was the it, it's something it was, they they would use wrath of God sometimes, even though they had creatures, because they're just like, well, this is one of the best cards. Yeah, and you know, we see that to this day to the extreme. I mean, there's every, you can't. You can't see – I don't think everybody realizes, uh, you know, that there was somebody who first came along. But John Kim was the one who identified, what if we just play with as many good cards as we possibly can and have ways to interact with the good cards that other people play and don't rely on specific combinations of cards? And we see that to this day with things like Junt, right? Yeah. Like. Often or in modern, we'll see these decks that are just pick the three best colors that work together. You know, like you might have like Abrupt Decay, Tarmogoyf, Liliana, Lightning Bolt, Terminate, and it's nothing but good cards without a reliance on a specific combination. I mean, I or you might see it. Uh, go ahead. I'd even make the argument a deck like Black Green Delirium and Standard. Like, the, when the Delirium triggers is great, 
right? Your deck is really, it's it's on high-octane fuel. But those cards are all pretty good, you know? Like, Traverse the Uvenwald on turn one is a very respectable play. And that, like, you're playing your Grim Flares, you know, eh, I'm little now, but I won't be little for too long. But then you're hitting your Lilianas. And in the mid-game, I don't even need to have Delirium for my Gear Hulk to make something massive, right? Like, that's just my curve up. And I, I think, like, the philosophy of decks like that, you know, like, what's the best, of, the most efficient removal spell that I can play in in a, in a copter format? Uh, Grasp of Darkness, right? What if I just play copters also? Check, right? What's the best big threat? Gear Hulk, in. You know, I'll play one black Gear Hulk because that works with my Traverse the Uvenwald. Uh, but it doesn't kind of need to. Traverse the Uvenwald is great on turn one, and it's great on turn 20. You know, I think that that, I think, still has some of the kin to it. No? Oh, I think I yeah, it does. I think like I think that one of the keys here is that even though that's not a completely pure example, I think it actually helps speak to how much the Kim school is actually just one of the fundamental pillars of magic. Like a full third of the game at all points is basically nowadays anyway, the way that they the you know the, the sort of design philosophies that Wizards has shifted to has really helps cement this as being a vital part, but uh, you can play with the best cards, you can play the fastest, or you can play the biggest, or you can play a combination that does one of these things sideways. Like, you can try to be the fastest deck. Like, there, every, like every deck that's actually a good strategy for winning is tr- aspiring to adopt one of the positions. They either want to be the fastest Or they want to have the best mana, they want to be the biggest, they want to be, you know, they want to have one of these things going for them. And one of the perennial most important things that a deck can aspire to try to do is be one of the deck. And it doesn't mean every deck should do this, but out of the three best decks of every format, the overwhelming majority of the time, one of those three best decks, its niche is that it has the most best cards. It doesn't necessarily rely on specific combinations. It might have cards that work together well, like your Traverse the Ulvenwald to find a Gear Hulk, but it doesn't rely on them. As opposed to like a Tolarian Academy deck that relies on Time Spiral or Stroke of Genius to make up for all the cards that it's spending on mana. You know? And actually, uh, this is a school that's very near and dear to my heart. The Obzon deck that I played before Obzon was called Obzon uh, was actually built on this exact philosophy. Oh, Fleece man. Main Lion. Yeah, Fleece Main Lion was the... I oh, love that deck. I mean, even if you think about cards like, how many people were mana confluencing at that Pro Tour? Right? Not enough. Not enough. You, know, you were like the beatdown deck with the most lands, mana confluence, also the control... I mean, I don't know, but you still had the biggest, right? So like, I just tried to... The, the way Actually, the way that deck got made, I was sitting around, but we were just talking about specific cards because we didn't really like decks... We just liked cards. And my my thinking, my, my theory was what if we just could play like what are like what color combination would let us play with the most cards that were on my list of the best cards? And you know, just which cards were performing well. And it was surprisingly Obzon. Like that was a color combination that nobody was like really interested in too much except when they were using uh, you know, like uh, enchantment theme deck. Enchant decks try to push the whole constellation thing. And uh, That was a spot where it was like everybody else was playing things like Lightning Strike or or whatever to try to, you know, come up with removal. And the thing I concluded was that Fleece Main Lion was the best thing you could do for two mana. Corsair of Cruffix was the best thing you could do for three mana. And this is besides Sylvan Karyatid. You know, Sylvan Karyatid was definitely the clear number one, but everybody had that in all their decks. Yeah, but you created the the difference that made the difference, right? By By identifying Redundant Awesome 2. I think, I think it's actually very telling. I think it was actually very telling in the finals of uh, of Pro Tour Atlanta. Uh, my opponent actually Nam Sung uh, Nam Sung Wook. He actually had Fleece Main Lions as well. They were in his sideboard of his Constellation deck, but he had realized how strong they were and used them to just transform against people, just like bring in more Fleece Main Lions, just because it's actually just the best thing, even though it has nothing to do with his theme. You played that last game so well. Like, I remember watching it live. Like, I, I don't know. I just, I know this is not on a theme of this episode. I just, ugh, 
So, I mean, obviously you were you had a lot of advantages that match. You talking about the game where he was mana screwed? Yes, you, he could have come back. Uh, you know, I don't know. I thought. T- Big you, tough guy plays real well when they're mana screwed and can't fight back. I, yeah. Well, look. Um, no, that was my specialty for that pro tour was people just getting mana screwed. And yeah, how about you get fighting. all your land drops into a mana conflict so you can cast your spells on curve? Just wondering. Which version do you, what's the version nowadays you see in modern of this? Uh, like, where is this? Is it Jund? Is that the, the, the deck that tries... Because it has Dark Confidant, Tarmogoyf, Liliana of the Veil, Lightning Bolt, Thought Seize, Abrupt Decay. Like, it's nothing but hits. I think Absan also, depending on which version you're talking about. Like, I mean, Siege Rhino in that version is a heck of a card, but then there's also ones that don't even have Siege Rhino. Lingering Souls is a good card. Like, Lingering Souls, Grim Flayer, like, when they're together, they're awesome. When they're separate, they're awesome. Right, like that's. I think that I think that the Abzan might be. I mean, they're both very much up there in terms of. I the only problem with Abzan is it's just not playable. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, a lot of folks disagree <laughs> with you who have uh, who have Pro Tour wins under their belts. Um, the uh, the one that I think might be it though is what about like Jess guy. Like if you think about like Snapcaster Maid, uh, Lightning see, Bolt, think, Restoration no, but- Angel. Like, I think that's something that I think that's something that they tell themselves. Like I think they like to believe that. And take me, take it from me. I've been there. I get it. Yeah. I know what it's like. Where they're like, okay, yeah, Snapcaster Mage is just so good. It is. Path Exile is so good. I love it. Writing it. Okay, so first of all, yes, I agree. Snapcaster Mage really is so good. That's true. Snapcaster Mage. You could even sell me on Snapcaster Mage being one not. I mean, Snapcaster Mage might be the best creature in Magic. You, I, you could sell me on it being. At least as good as Tarmogoyf. Sure. But you can't pretend. I mean, and, and, yeah, I get Vendillion Click is, like, incredibly good. That's it is. Card. You're the first person but I ever knew who, who was, uh, was um, you know, promoting that guy back in uh, back but in like, extended days. But, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You can't tell me that a Johnny Vengeance is actually as good as Liliana of the Veil. But it's not. You can't You can't tell me that... that uh, that like lightning helix is actually as good as abrupt decay. I mean, it's good, but abrupt decay. Come on, man. I mean, like that's like, and there's the just no way. There's no way is that mana Finks, leak is as, it is kitchen Finks as good as Liliana. No, and a lot of that most they don't play kitchen Finks anymore. All right, is yeah, all of Grim Flare as good as Grim Flare? <laughs> No, I mean, oh yeah, I was gonna say I don't think I didn't know if you're talking about Kitchen Finks and Jund or Kitchen Finks and, no, Kitchen and Jess guy. And Jess guy. No, 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 no. I think most of the way that people play Jess guy these days involves Nahiri at this point, just because that's actually like something powerful. But that's just so different than the than the ones we've been talking about. That's much more of a a little bit of a combo deck, you know. I, I think I can vote for Abzan and you can vote for Jund, and we're probably both right. I think that there's a... now we can't possibly both be right to begin with. If you're not saying the same thing I am, I mean. All right. Well, tell you what. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's switch gears. Cause I I will. Pull, yeah, pull. Send us a message. Let us know what's better, Jund or Abzan. No, no. For now, we've got better. Got which one's the better Kim school? Right. That's the bar. Not which one's a better deck. I mean, both of them get Naya burned out, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> all right. So I, I'm just playing Infect. All yeah. right. So here's the thing. If you're just play Infect. There's only been one one big tournament so far with, with Kaladesh, but I was going over the top 16 from it. In the top eight, five of the decks in the top eight, Kaladesh cards already. And many of them, like, already, like, this is a serious commitment to Kaladesh, right? So some of them are super slight, but some of them are, like, important. You know, let's talk about Infect. Winner of the Star City Games Classic um, two weeks ago, uh, Brad Carpenter played an Infect deck already three Blossoming Defense in his main deck from Kaladesh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Blossoming Defense is just an amazing magic card. It's just super, super efficient. And I think it's going to fly under the radar for a lot of people because it can, like, that card existed already when it was plus one, plus one, and hexproof, And nobody cared. But 
the difference between plus one, plus one, and hex proof, and plus two, plus two, and hex proof is night and day. Well, and a I deck mean, that does double damage, right? <laughs> well, and that's just like in general, plus, plus four in the real world. So, so look at the difference between Vapor Snag and Unsummon. Unsummon has been barely fringe playable only a couple of times in twenty years. You add and one only in, little, and typically only in standard, right? Or in smaller formats than standard. Yes. You, know? you add one little life loss, one point of life. And a blue mage isn't even the one who appreciates damage the most. But you add one little point of life, and suddenly Vapor Snag is a cross format, all star, help define the format. Right? Well, and that's just one damage. Not only that, but Vapor Snag gets played in multicolored decks. That's yes. the thing that is super telling about it. Like, it's one thing if it's just, like, only mono blue decks appreciate it. Like, eh, I'll play this in my blue creature deck, or maybe Merfolk will try it or something. That's one thing. But when a deck that is three colors is playing with Vapor Snag... And those like, colors are colors like Grixis colors that have Lightning Bolt and Terminate. Yeah, but they'll they have still access snag. Grixis <laughs> to Lightning Bolt and Terminate. Yes. Yes. Uh, so, but, so the, the point of all this is the extra... The plus one, plus one is worth even more than one point of damage because you can often get that one point of damage, but you can also point it at a creature, which is generally more useful, and also you can use it to save a card even more so. You can save your creature even more, you know? Yeah, so that's a great analog to Blossoming Offense, right? Because you could just use it to save a card, right? Because it gains, um, gains Hexproof. But it's also the offense part of Vapor Snag, right? Like additional point of damage is similar to Vapor Snag's one point of um, you know life loss that that uh, wasn't there with Unsummon. But I think Infect, which is already one of the top decks in Modern, is I, I I would not be surprised if this card eventually became four of main deck. Um, oh, I think it should be personally. I mean, become immense as a four of main deck is it took a while to catch on. That was like a one or two of main deck for a long time, but like. A lot of these decks are four of become immense. I mean, how do you how do you feel about blossoming defense against twisted image? Because some people play like four twisted image, which is crazy to me, right? Some people. I, it's crazy to me. I think it really depends on if you expect uh, how much a spell skite you expect in your local metagame. That's really what it just comes down to. It's purely a metagame call against spell skite. So I'm just looking at, at Brad Carpenter's like I don't think he had main deck or sideboard spell skate, which is actually pretty unusual for this archetype, right? Yeah. But um, anyway, just uh, that's that's the biggest one because there were multiple infect decks in the top eight. Obviously, uh, blossoming defense in both of them, and then there were more on the so- uh, I'm sorry, in the top sixteen, blossoming defense everywhere. So you know, Kaladesh making a splash in modern and infect. But wait, there's more. So, um, did you look at Arya Ruhi's burn deck? I think yep. it's an interesting thing to, to talk about because uh, Naya, you know, obviously I, I won a, a PPTQ with, with Naya Burn not that long ago, and, and we've talked a bunch about burn decks. This deck is super interesting. It has no green mana, right? He, uh, he just cut a Tarkus command in favor of main deck Skullcrack, so it's just red and white. And from Kaladesh, we're seeing ins- uh, inspiring vantage in this. There's only one copy, but I don't know if that's... I see, no, I see. I actually would have played at least uh, at least three if I were him. So here's the here's the thing. I, I respect maybe at least two, but at least two. So I respect not wanting to trim the uh, the Scalding Tarn, Wooded Foothill, Bloodstain Mire, Arid Mesa. You know, he's got three each of the fetch lands because he wants to. The fetch lands are, even though the fetch land is a, is basically just quite a bit worse than Inspiring Advantage in general for him. He must. He's just so committed to making sure that Searing Blaze does oh, the full the full big, three damage. Big thing. That's the big deal. That's why he's. That's why. That's why the, it's it's there. Uh, however, that said. He's using four mountains and three sacred foundry. I don't believe that you actually need seven red sources in a burn deck total. The biggest thing that you need to be able to do is make sure you always have one more land that you can fetch up for the turn that you go to try to finish them off with Searing Blaze at some point, right? But one of the things you can do against most opponents is hold another fetch land. You can hold a fetch land so that you can do it that turn. Now, it's better if you have a land in your deck that you can go get so that you can use Searing Blaze as an instant. But it's not a deal-breaker. 
And I think that this, there's nothing in the deck that costs more than three and almost nothing that costs more than two. I mean, most of the deck costs one. Right. So, so the, there's a so, lot of words yeah, going on. So, yeah. Uh, first of all, he has three set, he has eight mana producing lands, right? Which I think total with the one inspiring vantage, which I think is about the right number. Um, that, of inspiring vantage? No, no. Of to, mana of lands total. Lands. Mana producing lands, right? I agree with you. I think I might even play four inspiring vantage and and think about the fetch lands. And I'll tell you why I disagree a little bit with what you said. Number one, he doesn't have the pressure to get green, right? That that we had before. Like, reliance on on all those you know dozen fetch lands. It was partially because you had to fetch for multiple colors in the main deck. That's gone now. He, he, a single white source is all he needs to cast a lot of these off color cards. But the other thing is, you basically. You win games where you only have three lands in play. So Inspiring Vantage is always just plateau in this deck, more or less. It's awesome. Um, the card that I don't like about the deck is Flames of the Blood Hand, which is his, well, which is his uh, Grim Lava Mancer uh, replacement in the main deck. Like that, that was a two of Grim Lava Mancer in, we, in a lot of decks. Yeah, yeah. I do want to speak to the Inspiring Vantage part, though. Uh, just to be clear, I would personally play four Inspiring Vantage. I think I the would thing too. I, Right, so I think that, uh, I, I wanted to be clear, I'm, I was speaking from a position of, uh, I don't yet have enough confidence that I know if you can trim the fetch lands or not. Yep. I think that you could play at least two or three Inspiring Vantage by trimming some amount of the Sacred Foundries and Mountain. You could cut one Sacred Foundry and one Mountain, but I actually think that, or you could just cut a Mountain and a fetch land, but I actually think that it would be even better to just play the full four inspiring vantage. I think that those lands are more powerful than shock lands. And the, in a two color deck, they're better than fetch lands when one of the colors is mount, you know, red, where you're just not concerned about blood moon. He doesn't have planes anyway. It's not like he's fetching a planes. Yeah, I think you know? two sacred so boundary is all I, you need. Like, you don't even need Arid Mesa. You could just play all Blood, Say, Meyer, Scalding, Carn, and Wooded Foothills if you want. Like it, uh, it's, it's still better to have a mixture so that they can't get you a Pithing Needle. Because sometimes what will happen is people will look at your hand. Yep. And then they'll Pithing Needle one that you happen to have two fetch lands. Because, you know, they... That's true. It comes up sometimes. But either way, the point is that Inspiring Vantage and all five of those lands, I think, are going to be staples, just like the other five are. You know, and... Um, but anyway... Uh, the, a little bit of damage saved can be game winning because if the burn deck lives one more turn from an attack, you know, like if they didn't have to take two damage from their land and they live one more turn, that's one more turn to draw a burn spell. So the thing is, like, because he's decided to play Flames of the Blood Hand instead of Grim Lava Mancer, he just he requires cards in graveyard so much less, right? Than you know, for the example of the deck that I played. So I, I think, like, first of all, I hate Flames of the Blood Hand. It costs three. I would, play, I would just play Lightning Helix three and four. That's I would just play Lightning Helix three and I four. I think I would, too. Um, what do you think about two Smash to Smithereens and one Wear Tear in the sideboard? Because obviously he has to play something. He can't play Destructive Revelry. Uh, but I thought I thought that was a really interesting uh, set of choices. Because he has also three Path to Exile, which has kind of increased the number of Path to Exile um, over what's been played by some of the other decks, which I think... These are, in some ways, maybe reactions to Platinum Imperion. All those cards can target a Platinum Imperion. I, I personally would play four Smash to Smithereens. I just think Smash to Smithereens. I mean, if you if you want the help against Affinity, I just... Between Affinity and uh, all the miscellaneous weird artifact decks, I just think that most of the cards in a burn deck sideboard don't matter very much. Most of your... I mean, all your deck is all just Lava Spikes. And yeah, maybe well, there's you know specific upgrades, the, right? Like they I mean, are, but they. I, my point is that they are most of the like the amount of value over replacement you can get from having a deflecting palm or a flames of the blood hand compared to whatever burn spell you had in the main deck. It just isn't as big of a difference as being able to smash to smithereens uh, value over like to replace. Uh, you know, Flames of the Blood Hand with a Smash to Smithereens, the value of a replacement against an Affinity deck is breathtaking. Oh, I agree. I, I think Flames of the Blood Hand is not a strong card. It costs too much mana. No. It doesn't hit creatures. Like, I, I don't know. Not a fan. Huge fan of Inspire and Vantage, and I'm actually inspired by Arya's deck to uh, take another look at my Naya deck and see if just straight red-white is 
is the way to go because I think the mana looks great. Um, you know, if we go with multiple inspiring vantage, uh, I could see just cutting the green. It's it was actually one of the one of the things I was talked about. It's like oh, anytime you can cut green, you should because it, it allows you to save a little a little damage. But you know, I just wanted to say here's another deck. Kaladesh already making a splash in modern. Um, uh, kind of the same note. Uh, this is probably your favorite because I know you love Grixis X. David Nolan's Grixis Delver deck. He played two Spire Buff Canal in Grixis, and I'm just wondering. You have. I think you've probably made more Grixis uh, modern mana bases than anyone else I know. How do you feel about the fast lands in Grixis mana base? Love it. I mean, it's been a known issue for a long time, and just it's known. Black Cleave Cliffs is just, like, the best land. It's so good. Black Cleave Cliffs, which is the original black-red one, yep. that one was so nice in particular because of its ability to both cast Thought Seize and Lightning Bolt. On turn one. On turn one. Oh, it's a Dark turn. Slick, and Dark Slick Shores was always very, very desirable as well. However, Dark Slick Shores, every Dark Slick Shore you play is competing with Creeping Tar Pit. Whereas every Black Cleave Cliff was competing with Lava, you know, Lava Claw Reaches, which just isn't as steep a competition. And so the value of a replacement, you know, and that's not even counting stuff like River of Tears and things, you know, there's just so many better of options. So uh, whereas with Blue Red, you would often get stuck. Blue Red, it's like, oh, no, the best I can do is Sulphur Falls, which is like not bad, but you would often just play more steam vents than you really wanted just because you needed more blue and red dual lands, and there just weren't as good of replacement options. The fact that now there's a card that lets you on turn one both hold up spell snare and lightning bolt. No matter which of your two instants you might want to play, because you don't know. You don't know if they're about to play, if they're two drop, if they play a two drop, you're going to really want that spell snare. But if they activate their if they play, you know, if they play a Ravager on two, you'll want that. Uh, you'll want to, or a Plating on two. You'll want to spell snare it. But if they if they just activate their Nexus or something, you might want to just bolt it. I mean, there's just any number of different ways the game could play out. Particularly when somebody goes turn one Birds of Paradise, and if you hold up spell snare, they just play a three drop, and you're like, oh, I guess I have nothing. <laughs> Whereas if you now, of course, in that spot, you just usually just go ahead and bolt the the bird, but. In any case, having the the Serum Visions, Lightning Bolt, Spell Snare, having all those available, but really just having a dual land that doesn't do any damage to you, that's a big deal. Oh, I think that having just, for this deck in particular, like, one of the reasons I don't like Grixis Delver in, in formats like Modern is you put so much pressure on your own uh, life total, and then you just, you have all these really good cards, right? You have, like, Snapcaster Mages and Pyromancers and huge Delve creatures, and you just could get well, so, ag- aggroed out or burned out because you put so much pressure on your own on your own life total. I think just any any port in a storm. The fact that you can go after sideboarding, especially like Magma Spray or Spell Pierce on turn one, right? That's cool. I, w- I do want to mention one of the special superpowers that makes me particularly interested in Spire Bluff Canal and to a degree uh, Botanical Sanctum. They're both sources of blue that are A1, Tier 1, super tippity-top, unbelievably powerful, and they are not hit by choke. That is such a big oh. deal. Many, many times, many times, like the, the blue-red deck that Paul Rietzel and I played at Worlds, uh, the one where I lost to Shahar, that Worlds, uh, the blue-red Treasure Cruise uh, aggro deck, that Delver deck that we played, we would have snapped off four, uh, uh, four Spire Bluff Canals. We would have loved it. That would have been the best land. We would have loved it. The, we actually played with Sulphur Falls, not because we thought that it was going to be good for the mana base in general. We literally just wanted Sulphur Falls so that it would be a source that wouldn't get tapped down by Choke. Many times in Grixis, I have to do this so often, where you play with Creeping Tar Pit, or you play with Dark Slick Shores, you play with something, because you need a certain critical mass threshold of blue sources to be able to operate through a choke. And if you do this, you don't have any problems. That's fine. Spire Bluff Canal is going to devastate the use of choke. Oh, I think, like, one of the, one of the things that's cool about this is, do you even need the black, right? Like... Imagine this is a crazy question to ask. 
like the black cards are good, but like I feel like. Well, I think Madcap, ex- Madcap, in, in, I think that Madcap experiment to find Platinum Imperium. That's that's I think uh, so powerful of a thing that I'd rather stay blue red and just increase the consistency. I mean, it's possible that the discard helps, but. I think that we should be looking more and more for how to... And it looks like Madcap Experiment has already shown up. That's right. Wesley C., who's fourth place at this Classic, played a Blue-Red Storm deck. Interestingly, he didn't play uh, Spire Bluff Canal, though. Um, he played an old mana base, but he played, like, the the very John Finkel style of, like, four Goblin Electromancer, etc. But in his sideboard, four Madcap Experiment, two Platinum Imperion. So he had it in the sideboard, not in the main deck. But obviously, I think next to Blossoming Defense, this is the, the most Kaladesh thing that we've seen in Modern so far. And I think it's just going to be more popular. Well, so, uh, I mean, Ke- Blaine Davis came in seventh with a Kiki Evolution deck. You know, uh, Eldritch Evolution to set up the Kiki Jiki Restoration and the Angel Combo. Um, interestingly, he had four Filigree Familiars in his deck as Sacrifice Fodder. You know, for his Eldritch Evolution, because you can sacrifice Filigree Familiar to cast to go get Kiki Jiki or Restoration Angel, whichever part of the combo you're missing. And it was sort of just this this natural, you know, turn one Bird of Paradise or Noble Hierarch, turn two Filigree Familiar, and your opponent is he- like, what are they going to do? Because normally what would happen is people would just bolt your three drop. But when your only three drops are. You know, when your three drops are like Filigree Familiar and Eternal Witness, it's just, how, how, what are they, uh, what, what's going on here? You know, what's the plan? <laughs> but then he also had a Chandra Torch of Defiance in his main deck just for value. And then in his sideboard, Authority of the Consuls as a sideboard option. Like, this is a lot of Kaladesh all over the place, right? I think it's amazing how some of these new sets, you know, from... Um, from Grim Flayers to, to some of these new cards from Kaladesh, there's obviously a very small number of events that happened so far, have had such dramatic effect already on formats that are especially desi- um, you know, defined by linear strategies, right? Like, this is a format that is like, Burn is one of the top decks, Merfolk, Affinity, and I was, I was actually interested, I, didn't, I, I thought there would be Copters and Affinity decks, but we haven't seen that yet, I don't know. No, we have, actually, we have? John Dale, B- yeah. So John Dale Beatty uh, uh, actually finished fifth at an SCG in, uh, IQ uh, with affinity with two smugglers copters. Oh. And I don't know what the right number is yet, but it, it's the first time we're seeing it. He actually had a couple innovations in his list. He, his other twists. So, I mean, first, right up front, smugglers copter. Super cool. But then second, he actually has uh, Sanctum of Ugin. X4. He was playing four Sanctum of Ugin, you know, because you, know, you always start with the four Dark Steel Citadel, four Blink Moth Nexus, four Ink Moth Nexus, and then often like one basic for Path to Exile. For him, he actually played four Sanctum of Ugins instead of Glimmer Voids in order to, to take advantage of his Mirror Enforcers so that later he could actually just convert his land. Like, you know, he plays a Mirror Enforcer eventually. And then can just convert his land into uh, an etched champion or an arcbound ravager. That's interesting. That's a is that a, a first time we've seen something like this in Affinity? Because Mirror uh, Forcer has not I, been real popular for a while. Right? Not for a very long time. No, this is the first time I've I've seen this this combination of Sanctum of Ugin with Mirror Enforcer, and it actually got me thinking. I wonder if there's a way to play stuff like. Mirror Enforcer, or, or 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 even, I mean, I would love if there was a version that had uh, the Gear Seeker Serpent. I think Gear Seeker Serpent is just so much more. Now, it, it's not an artifact, but it's a five six, and it's the same cost as Mirror Enforcer if you can just come up with the two blue. Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know? that's the prohibitive part. That that's but really tough. The nice thing about if you had a deck, if you could somehow sculpt an affinity deck that has both Mirror Enforcer and Gear Seeker Serpent, even if you didn't play the full eight, if you just played some amount of that, what if you actually just played with, like, Elder Deep Fiend? Like, I mean, I, I know we're getting into some weird kind of stuff, but I wonder. But you that's, know, that's just a... This is just what we're talking about with Schools of Magic. Somebody has to come up with this weird stuff first, Right. And then Look at some at, point in the future, it's just that's just stock, right? That's just, it just becomes, you know, like, embraced by the whole community because it ends up being good or right. 
Yeah, I mean, like, look at John Dale Beatty. His sideboard actually includes two copies of GURP or Aethergrid, which nowadays we consider to just be standard. That's not weird. It's not unusual to see people just play GURP or Aethergrid. I remember when Sam Black and Paul Rietzel, they're just talking about GURP or Aethergrid as though this is, that you know, it, it was crazy when they first tried it, but they tried it, and it was good. Yeah, and it's and they still just awesome. Went <laughs> yeah, they just went with it. They're just like, you know what? I know that this is crazy. We, we tried it at first, and it sounded crazy, but it actually was awesome so that when somebody else puts out re, uh, their Stony Silence, you've got a plan because it's the Aether Grid that taps the artifact, yep. not the artifact itself. And it's really powerful, right? It also kind of turns their their oh, yeah. uh, their aggressive linear deck into the Weissman deck, kind of, right? It's It's like... Their defensive card can play offense at some point, and it's a bunch of creature removal, kind of. So, um, I like that. So, we said that we wanted to, you know, something old, something new. You know, we, we started with the Schools of Magic, and then we uh, went to a bunch of the new modern decks. So, let's finish on something blue. I don't know, have you seen Jake Willingham's deck? It doesn't have any new Kaladesh stuff, but I just love it, right? It's a mono blue Delver deck. It's got Delver, Snapcaster Mage, Thing in the Ice, and Vendillion Click for Creatures, 14 Creatures. Then 18 lands, including two Mutavault, a bunch of Fetch lands, and some Islands. But it's got your four Vapor Snags, right? And it's got, like, Cryptic Command, Remand, Disrupting Shoal, and da 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 Three Psionic Blasts. This is, this is awesome, in my opinion. I hope it's good. I want to try it, actually. What do you think about that, Patrick? Delvers and Psionic Blasts, Mono Blue, Vapor Snake, uh, get in there. It's Q. I just, it's so hard for me to not, like, to imagine not playing Lightning Bolt. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I just, like, to not play Lightning Bolt is, you're asking a lot here. But it's funny that you should mention this, because this actually, in some ways, uh, it, it, it links back a little bit to, um, it's funny, there's like this blending of uh, the Chang School, and uh, actually Handelman, because Handelman was all, you know, put down the Hypnotic Spectre or the Juzam and, uh, and then protect it with, like, Mana Drain or disrupt them with him to Turok, right? Like, that, just because those were, like, good cards going on. But that, and that was just one specific implementation. Obviously, he was mostly just about playing the, the, uh, the, the sort of just a super good card with salt, with very light control element or light disruption or light whatever. But then the other side, when we actually look at Chang, <laughs> he actually just played straight up four Sonic Blasts. Yeah. You know, four Mana Drain, four Sonic Blasts. Now, this one I think is properly a different strategy because his only creatures were, were Jade Statues. He was actually doing a little bit of the Weissman thing with regards to um, the, uh, you know, at times obsoleting their their removal to an extreme like he would win with like blood moon and jade statue because it was a you know an artifact that could dodge it was more like a smuggler's captor if you will yeah but but uh either way it's sweet to see psionic blast making a comeback yeah i actually love it in this you know there was when psionic blast was in standard we just put it like in every blue deck it was like it just was so perfect you know like you would basically time walk people it, are you talking about like twenty years ago? Or are you talking about like no? I was talking about like like time spiral. Five. Yeah, we just played play a ton of blue decks. Yeah, I, I don't see. I yeah, it, it was tricky. It was it was sweet in the more aggressive ones. I don't think it was necessarily always right to play. Oh, no, the, it, uh, it was the more aggressive. defensive ones. It was good in blue green. Really, really good in blue green. Oh, definitely, it was fantastic. There. Like the, they want, they valued, they appreciated the removal so much. Yeah, the Elf Oren Viper deck. That one was sweet. So. Oh, but anyway, I just wanted to end on something blue. I think this one, I'm going to try it. I, I can't imagine that this implementation without Lightning Bolt is, is probably the best version. But um, I just love, you know, Delver Snapcaster Psionic Blast. It's, it just, it warms my heart. So, <laughs> you know, you need to go. Um, but uh, that was, uh, you know, something old, something borrowed, something blue. Uh, and uh, Borrowed? Borrowed. It borrowed. I mean, unrelated, but... If uh, if you could go ahead and, and lend me like four smugglers copters, four aether uh, aetherworks marvels. So I um, 
I F and M'd last week, and I and Zach was at the store. I don't even F and M at the store very often. We didn't talk to each other, and and he's just like, I came to F and M tonight because I thought you'd come. <laughs> so I came, and then I, I like we, we sit down, and I'm like, this is the worst F and M. Like the table had like four players who were I had played on the pro tour before. So like you know normally you want to go to F and M and just like win win win. It was actually going to be a tough table. And yep. um, I was just like, oh, I'm just going to open a smuggler's copter. So I opened my pack, and you can't do this at the Pro Tour, but then I just laid the smuggler's copter in the middle of the table as I passed to Zach. And he's just like, well, that was a good called shot. Uh, Punchline, all of us lost. So we went 0-4 and went to Outback Steakhouse. Uh, and that, that was it. But um, we're Top Level Podcast. Uh, you can find us <laughs> lots of places. Uh, YouTube. Hawaii. Facebook, Hawaii, Twitter, and Patreon. Patreon. Shout out, of course, to Sean O'Brien, who uh, came up with uh, this week's first half topic. Um, yeah, uh, good luck to Patrick in Hawaii. Probably going to win uh, his uh, second pro tour this weekend. I, I kind of want to revisit a little bit in the future, too, some of the other schools, because I do think it's actually super fascinating looking at which ones, you know, just from a critical lens, which ones have, like, Survive the test of time, and which ones eventually were part, you know, early progenitors to uh, to a different approach these days. Oh man, you don't have to you don't have to say it twice, man. I, I I literally ran away from home to follow the creative schools of magic. That's that's what I did with my life. <laughs> so, all right, cool, Patrick. Good luck. All right, thanks, man, and thank you guys all. See you guys uh, next week, or maybe this weekend on coverage. Bye bye. And life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, you could jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber stasis. Lost a lot of friends, got left.